want to um, say a couple of things. Harv's in, introduction was wonderful. I appreciate all the, the, the uh, I'm not going to do a lot of processes with you today. I am going to share some ideas with you and some insights and some of my own personal story. Hopefully it will inspire you. Some of the tools I'll share with you may be new, may be empowering. Um, it's kind of like coming to a place where everyone's done 100,000 workshops already. But I think I can share some new ideas with you. I want to share a chicken soup story with you. There was a, um, a story that was sent in by Norman Cousins. And Norman was the editor of Saturday Review magazine. And he coined the term psychoneuroimmunology. Your psyche, your attitude affects your neurosystem, affects your immune system. We know the more positive you are, the more optimistic you are, the higher your uh, attitude is in terms of um, positive expectation and joy, the less ill you get. And then if you do get ill, you get, you get uh, better quicker. And he sent in this story called The Wee Nurse. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you have been in the hospital overnight? Can I see a show of hands? Have you ever had a wee nurse? A wee nurse comes in, in the morning and says, did we sleep okay last night? We didn't eat all our breakfast today, did we? And a favorite one that he hated was, she'd come in and say, we haven't had our bowel movement yet today, have we? And this wee thing irritated him. And one day she did, he decided he wanted to get back at her. So she came in and um, she asked for, she had a little plastic cup. She said, we need a urine sample. And he said, okay, if you'll leave the room, we'll make one. So she left and went out in the hall. And he looked over on his breakfast tray and it was a glass of apple juice, which he had not yet drunk. He took the apple juice, poured it into the specimen cup, rang the little buzzer. She came back in. He handed it to her. She looked at it and said, my, we're a little cloudy today, aren't we? He said, here, give it back. And he grabbed it back from her, took the cap off, and then proceeded to drink the whole thing down and said, let me run it through again for you. I'll see if I can make it come out clearer this time. Now I was over in Bangkok. How many of you have been to Bangkok, Thailand? How many of you have seen the Golden Buddha? It's one of the three tourist attractions. You always see the Jay Buddha, the Golden Buddha, and the Reclining Buddha, and that kind of thing. And this Buddha is ten and a half feet tall of solid gold. The gold value alone is about $196 million. That doesn't even count the artistic and the historical value. And when my wife was taking that picture, I was over next to the, I'd say about five feet away, there was a big glass case. And in that case, there was a piece of clay, about a foot wide, two feet tall, two feet thick. And it said that in 1953, they did not know there was such a thing as a golden Buddha. They were moving this large clay Buddha from one side of Bangkok to the other to make room for a road that was coming through. And as they picked up the Buddha with the crane, because it was very heavy, a big crack went down through it. And as the crack went down through it, the head monk got scared and he lowered the Buddha down. And he said, you know, we better take a look at it and see if we've done any damage to it. And it started to rain, so they put a canvas over it to keep it dry. That night the monk came out and he shined a flashlight in to see if it was staying dry and something reflected back from inside the crack. He said, clay does not reflect light, there must be something else in there. And so the next morning they chipped away in behind where they wouldn't see it if they made a mistake and lo and behold, sure enough, was this golden Buddha. And their best theory is that 300 years earlier when the Burmese were attacking Thailand, the monks of this monastery covered up the golden Buddha with clay to make it look worthless so they wouldn't steal it. They also think all the monks were killed in a massacre and the secret died with the monks. And then they rediscovered it. The word discover means what? Take the cover off of, discover something. It was always in there, but they took the cover off. I was having dinner with my wife that night and she said, you know, Jack, that Buddha is like all the people in our seminars. They come in with this cover of clay of their negative beliefs, their self-doubt, their sense of guilt and shame, their beliefs that they're not enough, that they're not worthy, they don't deserve. And, and what we really do is we take the clay off so this golden essence can come and be there as who they are again, they're a true identity. It's not like we put anything in, it's just that we remove the things that are not there. I think Barbara talked a little about that earlier today. 
So as we go through this next hour and a half, think about and hold that metaphor, that image of the Buddha, and it could be the golden Christ, the golden Buddha, the Atman, the source, whatever you want to call it, but that's who you really are. And although we do a lot of things of giving you more information and tools and all of that, really if you were to stop doing the stuff that's negative, as, as Harv said, you've been defined. When you came in, you were just fine. And what we did was we layered on all that stuff. If we could just start to remove that and realize that everything you need is in you now. You have everything you need to do everything you want to do. It's just that we learn not to trust that. So we'll hold that as a metaphor. Now, you heard this morning, I was listening, I've got one of these great rooms right over here where I could sit in my room and listen to what was going on down here. And whoever was introducing in the morning said, do you know about this combination lock idea? And I think you had, um, what is it? Um, 10, 24, 7, yeah. And think about that model. I was eating dinner with a guy who's the Alabama State chess champion. We were talking about success. And he said, if you know the combination to the lock, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're black or white, young or old, male or female, if your IQ is 150 or your IQ is 50. If you know the combination, the lock has to open. And what I've discovered in my work, and I've been doing this work for 30 years. I started with a man named W. Clement Stone, who was worth $600 million back in 1968. And he taught me everything he knew about success, and I've been applying it to my own life and teaching it to others. And then I've done hundreds and hundreds of workshops where I've been the student and gone to India and studied with masters and so on over the years. But there is a combination, there is a system. If you know the combination, you can unlock success. The problem is many of us are missing a few of the numbers. And so what I'd like to do today is just kind of remind us and maybe share some of the new things that you might have forgotten. Now here's a man named J. Paul Getty. He was at once the richest man in America. And when they asked him what were the secrets of success, he said there are three. It's very simple. He said get up early, work hard, and find oil. Not that complicated. <laughs> so obviously it's a little more tricky than that. At Keller Williams, they have a formula or a system. This is a real estate sales company. And they said, if you'll make five in-person sales calls and 10 over-the-phone calls every day, write 15 thank you notes to the 15 people you talk to and view five new properties, that system always produces a high success rate in this company. So it's a system. It's a formula. Again, 5, 10, 15, 5. Again, this morning, 10, 24, 7, that you've learned in peak potentials. So there are some formulas. Now, when I studied this, I came up with 64 universal principles that I've studied over the last 36 years. I don't expect to share all those with you today. Maybe we'll get through nine if we're lucky. But this is a book I wrote called The Success Principles. It's now in 17 languages. You can see a couple of them up there. The one on the far left is in Russian. I was just speaking in Cannes last week in France to 6,500 women from Russia, the Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. I found out my name over there is Jiak. Literally, we'd come out of the hotel and there'd be 500 women going, Jiak, Jiak, photo Jiak, autograph Jiak. And all of a sudden, I was really glad I'm not Brad Pitt because you couldn't move. But anyway, this book has really taken Russia by storm. And there was one man stood up and he said, you know, I bought a hundred copies of your book and gave them to everyone in my village. And our village has totally changed. We've changed how we're governing ourselves. We've changed how we're doing business. So we know these principles work universally. They're not just American principles. And I'll also share a little bit of some of the new ideas that I have about the law of attraction that has to come out of the, out of the, the, the secret. There's some things I think that are missing in that movie things we said but that got edited out that I think are useful to touch on. So that's where we'll be going today. Now would you rather take the short route or the long route to success? Very good. Me too. Wouldn't it make sense to just go straight for the cheese and not get caught in the maze? So I've devoted my life to go further and faster with less effort. My next book is called Effortless Success. Uh, Alan Cohen, who talked to you uh, yesterday, has a book. I just bought it in the airport, didn't even know it was out yesterday, read it halfway here um, to Denver yesterday before I came to Aspen, called Relax Into Wealth. And so what we're all seeing now is it doesn't have to be as hard as most of us had made it. So we'll talk about how we can make it a little easier. Now the promise I make, if you do the things I teach you, you can learn to double your income and double your time off and create more balance and fun in your life. And all of my students who work with me do that in two years or less. So it's easy to do if you put in the time and you make the commitment to do the work. 
Now, in my own life, as Mark shared with you this morning, we've sold over 110 million copies of our books that are in 47 languages right now. And this is little Marky Hansen that came from Waukegan, Illinois, and little Jackie Canfield who grew up in West Virginia. And when I grew up in West Virginia, we were the 48th worst state in terms of education in the country, and that's when there wasn't Alaska and Hawaii as states, so we were the bottom. I had a dysfunctional family. My mother was an alcoholic. My father was a workaholic and somewhat abusive. She divorced him when I was six, you know, to save the kids from getting beat up. And so if I can do it, you can do it. I graduated from the half of the class in my college that made the top half possible. So just want you to understand it's not about brain power, but it's about how you use your brain to do the work. Okay. Mark and I also have a Guinness Book of World Records. You probably know that. We have seven books on the New York Times bestseller list on one day. And I share with that with you not to impress you about me, but to impress upon you if a little kid from West Virginia who got a C in composition in college can go on and become a best-selling author, anybody in this area here can do anything as well. There's a book, a check written to me for $1,130,328.35. Publisher wrote a... It was the first check he ever wrote for a million dollars. He put a smiley face in his signature. Mark and I got four of those checks that year. Our combined income each that year was over six million dollars. Again, if I can do it, you can do it. Jim Rohn, great motivational speaker, says you can't hire other people to do your push-ups for you. Think about that. I can't hire anyone here to go to Gold's Gym and work out for me. You can't do my meditation for me. You can't do my visualization for me. All the things that I'm going to share with you are things you cannot delegate to others. This is the work. Harv said, there's work to do. You have to work on yourself. When I speak at the National Speakers Association, and people say, I want to be a speaker like you. I want to go out and make all money and affect the world and change people. What, what advice would you give me? And I said, the first thing is work on yourself. When I first learned about personal growth, I took 38 weekend workshops in one year. The only weekends I wasn't taking workshops was when there weren't any. Mother's Day, Thanksgiving, Easter, Christmas, etc. Spent $17,000 out of my $38,000 income taking workshops back when they were like $100 for a weekend. But the point is, it's that level of work on yourself that opens up and takes off the clay and allows your natural genius to come forward. Buckminster Fuller, who Mark Victor Hansen talked about, said there's no such thing as a genius. He said some children are just damaged less. It means there's less clay on the golden Buddha or the golden Christ that lives inside of each of them. Now the first principle, if you're taking notes, this would be a good place to start. And if you're not taking notes, this would also be a good place to start. And that is to take 100% responsibility for your life and your results. Now most of you have heard that before, but I would ask you a question. Have you ever blamed anyone for anything in the last year? We get mad perhaps at the president or the economy or the oil prices, or we blame other people for our not being successful. You literally have to give up all blaming and take 100% responsibility for your life that you're creating it the way it is. You have to give up complaining. Complaining means I have a reference point for something I prefer that I'm not willing to risk creating. If I was complaining about my wife, it would mean that I have to have a reference point of someone better out there that I would rather be with that I'm not willing to risk leaving my wife to go be with. Or I'd have to risk working with my wife and sharing with her there were things I didn't like about her that she would, I would want her to change and that might create a conversation that might be a little bit uncomfortable. But without taking that risk, I can't create what I want. If all the women in the, do in the world tomorrow died except for my wife and I came to work, would I be complaining about my wife? No, I'd be going, hey, there's only one woman and guess what? I got her. <laughs> you only complain when there's a possibility of something better. Complaining tells you there's something I want I don't have and when you complain, that's not an activity that's going to produce it. It's simply something that says I'm going to complain about it rather than do anything about it. Give up all justifying for why you didn't achieve your results, all defending your positions that don't work, and all excuse making. Now, I met this kid named Matty Christensen when he was 11 years old. We were interviewing him for one of our chicken soup books. And he said, now if you look at the picture, you'll notice he has no arms past the elbow and no legs past the knee. He's got two prosthetic devices on his knee, you know, from the knee down for his legs and his feet. And he's got a lacrosse stick appended to his arm, prosthetic device, which allows that to be his pitching hand and his catching glove. 
And at 11 years old, Maddie's baseball team was number two in the state of New York with him being the pitcher. So what that tells us is it doesn't matter what your condition is, you can still choose to create what you want and become a champion. Maddie said to me when I interviewed him, he said, you have to give up all of your excuses and find a way. He says, if you're going to be successful, you have to be solution oriented rather than a complainer. I was getting a seminar on success from an 11 year old boy. Now there are three things we have control over in your life. Your thoughts, your images, and your behavior and your actions. You know, Harv does a seminar called The Millionaire Mind. It's the idea of our thoughts making and controlling our reality. So I want to look at thoughts with you for just a minute. We'll see how the weather holds out here. Hopefully we'll make it through this. What I'd like you to do is look down at the end of your hand. You'll notice there is a little line that goes across your wrist. Does everybody have like a little indentation, a little wrinkle that goes across there? And you'll have one on the other side as well. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to line those up perfectly and then put your hands together like that, but start them so that they're coming directly from that line. And if you're like most people, you're going to find that one of your hands is a little longer than the other. Most of you find that? Take your shorter hand and put it in front of your face. If your hands are the same length when you do that, take either hand and put it in front of your face. And here's what I want you to do. I'm from California, like Barbara, so we do a lot of weird stuff there. So I want you to look at your hand, and we're going to say out loud in unison eight times, grow longer. Okay? So we're just going to intend for our hand to grow longer. We're going to do it in unison. So here we go. One, two, three. Grow longer. Grow longer. Grow longer, grow longer, grow longer, grow longer, grow longer, grow longer. Okay, stop. Now line them up exactly the same as before and notice what happened. How many of you found that it did get longer? Very good. So what this shows us is the power of our intention and the power of our minds over physical matter, starting with our body. And we see that we actually have that power over physical matter all throughout the universe. Now, I have, the good news is we can do this. The bad news, in case there are any men thinking about this, is that um, so far the research has only been on the hands, okay? So I don't want you to waste a lot of time tonight with this. All right. Now we've all heard of the internet. You've all used the internet. You've got Blackberries and you send wireless telephone calls. We can call someone in Singapore right now and talk to them. How does that work? There's waves that go through the air and there's what we call amplitude. How high does the wave go? And there's frequency. How often does it go up and down? And by controlling those amplitudes and frequencies, we can create information, we can encode information and send it across the world. We now know, a friend of mine coined the term the internet, a guy named Bob Scheinfeld, who wrote a book called Ending the, or Busting Loose from the Money Game, and he, he, he made the point that we literally, every thought we think is extended around the world like a giant email sent out over this thing which he f refers to as the internet. And we know that it works and we know it goes quite far for the following reason. There is research with the astronauts where they'll have astronauts up on the moon or up in lunar modules, 250,000 miles above the earth, and they'll have them open envelopes at random times and there'll be a, a shape in there like a square or a circle or a pentagon or a parallelogram or a rectangle. And they'll look at it and they'll concentrate on it for several minutes while there are students back at Duke University in the parapsychology labs who will close their eyes, go into a meditative state, and see if they can receive what the astronaut's sending. And they get a high correlation between what they're sending, way beyond chance, in terms of them able to pick up this thought form without any amplification through technology or you know, energy waves, radio waves, that kind of thing. So we know that our thoughts can travel 250,000 miles. So I love what Ralph Wando Emerson said. He said, great men are they who see the spiritual thought is stronger than ma any material force that their thoughts rule the world. Our thoughts literally travel all across the world. 
There's actually people that are now contemplating and, and projecting out from their work in quantum physics and neuroscience and metaphysics that one hour of inner work, working with visualization, working with the law of attraction, working with affirmations, working with the power of intention like you just did with Grow Longer, that one hour of that kind of work actually will produce the same results of seven hours of physical labor in the world in terms of achieving your goals, whether they're financial goals like becoming a millionaire or whether they're other kinds of goals like ending world hunger, that kind of thing. How many of you are familiar with the work of Dr. Masaru Emoto, the uh, Messages of Water? Great. So Emoto's work proves that when we think thoughts about water, it changes the molecular structure of the water. So they would have students send negative energy up to a bottle of water, like you fool, you idiot, and what would happen, they'll take that water and they will freeze it to 20 degrees below zero, put it in a petri dish, and then they will bring it out, put it under a microscope, and they will look at that water, and as it starts to melt, it forms crystals, or not. When you send negative energy, you get this kind of blobby black formation that occurs. When you send love and gratitude or thank you, you get these beautiful crystals that look like snowflakes. And so we know that one kind of energy, which we call negative critical energy, creates one form, and positive energy creates another. Then he said, how far does this intention to the water extend? So they took, they took 10,000 Japanese, and over a two-hour period, they sent love to all the water in the world. This was a couple of summers ago in July. And they took water samples the day before and the day after, and look what happened. Here's water taken from Lake Biwa, it's the largest freshwater lake in Japan, the day before this nondescript kind of energy. Two days later, we see these beautiful crystals having been formed. Here's Lake, the St. Croix River up near Minnesota in Wisconsin. And we see the day before and we see the day after. The day after we get these crystals. Here's the Mississippi River. We're halfway around the world and we're, our thoughts are still affecting the water. And as you know from Masaru Omoto's work, your body is 80, about 80 to 85% water. Although today you're probably more like 75% because you haven't been drinking enough. But the idea is we are water and our thoughts are affecting us and each other. And so what does this tell us about success? Every thought I think, they're not going to buy my product. They won't like my record. They're not going to give me a job. We're not going to find a parking space. You are literally sending out energy ahead of you that's pre-paving the highway you're driving down and setting up the kind of response you're going to get, especially when it deals with individuals because you're telling them how to think. And then you walk in and they go, nah, they, they already have a pre um, determined kind of attitude toward you based on the thoughts you were thinking before you even met them. Back 30 years ago when I started taking workshops, we would literally bring people into a, we called it a laboratory or a workshop, sanctuary, and the day before we were having a meeting, we'd bring them in through a people mover and we'd interview them. What, what, what is it you need to know about me in order to make a decision? What are your hot buttons? What are your fears? What makes you decide yes? And we would get all this information from them because literally it's all available because all the thoughts they've ever thought are out there as waveforms like an archive that you could go to on Google or something to pull forward the information. So it's critical that we learn the power of our mind and use it. And I know most of you know this, but it's important to really see the, how far this extends. So again, your reality is not the cause of your thoughts and your feelings, but your thoughts and feelings are in fact what is creating your reality. Now every thought you send is a vibration. And I want to share a story with you. Mark and I decided one day that we were going to sell a million books in one day. No one had ever done that up until then. Since then, uh, J.K. Rowling's done it with, I think, the third Harry Potter book. Now, at that point, there was no model to go after, no one to say, how did you do it so we can model what you did. We simply had a vision and a goal. And we started holding this in our mind every day. We'd see a picture, a New York Times headline, Canfield and Hanson sell a million books in one day. And we visualized it, we intended it, we put energy into it, we talked about it, we fantasized about it, we believed it was possible. About 35 days later, we're at this conference in New York. We're at this conference in New York where uh, they have the um, American Booksellers Association convention. And I get on a bus after the convention to go back to the hotel. I sit down next to this woman and she says, you're Jack Canfield, aren't you? And I said, yeah, thinking she knows who I am, I'm pretty cool. And then she said, 
it's your name tag. Kind of reduced my ego a little bit. And then she said, what are you and Mark up to? You're the chicken soup guys, right? And I said, yeah. I said, we just decided to sell a million books in one day. She said, really? I can help you do that. As fast as I said it, she said, I can help you do that. And I said, really, how? She said, I'm the buyer for the W.H. Smith bookstores. Now, if you've ever been in an airport, most of them have a W.H. Smith bookstore. And she said, what we could do is put all your co-authors, along with you and Mark, in the East Coast around 6 in the morning, and we'll put you in New York and Boston and Washington and Atlanta and Miami, and we'll have you sign books for two hours. And then we'll put you on a plane and we'll fly you over to, like, you know, Cleveland and Detroit and Chicago and... Then we'll fly you again to maybe Salt Lake City and Dallas and we'll take you all the way across the country in the evening you can be signing books in um, California and Portland, Oregon and Washington DC. I said, why would you help us do that? She called me dummy at that point. She said, dummy, if I sold a million books in one day, don't you think that'd make me look like a champion of my boss? I said, absolutely, I get it. Now. A lot of people would say, oh, you were just lucky. That was coincidental that you got this person to sit down next to you. I say, no. We sent out an email saying, Jack and Mark want to sell a million books and one day anyone who wants to play, please reply. And the way she replied was by sitting next to me on the bus. When you start using the law of attraction, you don't always attract to you the item. You don't get the car showing up in your garage. But what you do get is the resources, the strategies, the magazine articles, the books that people put in your hand, the seminars they tell you to take, and people like this sitting down next to you saying, hey, I can partner with you and we can make this happen. And that's happened over and over and over and over in our life. A couple of months ago, I said, I want to go to the Olympics in Beijing. I've never been to the Olympics except in LA for one day. I said, I want to go. 30 days later, I'm walking into a company that I do some speaking for called Isogenics to give them a big motivational talk. And as I'm walking in, in the back of the room, this Chinese guy walks up to me and he says, are you Jack Canfield? And I said, yeah. He said, have you ever spoken in China? I said, Hong Kong, but not mainland China. He said, how would you like to do that? I said, great. I said, even more importantly, I'd like to get tickets to the Olympics. He says, oh, that's a done deal. I can get that for you. He walked up to me. So literally, you'll start having these people come into your life. There's actions you have to take, but it gets very, very exciting. So we want to use the internet. I just told you that, so we'll move on here. Now, you may remember in the movie The Secret, it talks about the three steps. Ask, believe, and receive. And I want to take this ask part a little deeper today. So the success principle two that I write about in my book is called decide exactly what you want, which is the asking part. Having preferences, having desires, setting goals, having a vision, having objectives, becoming a millionaire, whatever it is that you want. Now, remember in The Secret, it says, talk about what you want, not what you don't want. I was interviewing a woman, a counseling client, and she said, I want you to teach me how to use the law of attraction to get the perfect guy in my life. I said, great, describe your perfect guy. She said, oh no, I know exactly what I want. Just teach me how to use the law of attraction. I said, I will, but I want to make sure you've got this right. She said, okay, I want a guy that doesn't smoke, that doesn't screw around, that doesn't watch TV all weekend, that's not a sports maniac and never spends time in never And she gave me 11 things she didn't want. It doesn't work. You have to focus on the positive, not the negative. Now here's a guy named Lou Holtz. Lou Holtz was the coach of the Notre Dame football team. Several national championships, many bowl game championships and so forth. His recent book is called Wins, Losses and Lessons. Now I wrote a book or edited a book a year ago called You've Got to Read This Book and I interviewed 55 people along with Gay Hendricks about the book that had changed their life. Was there one book that changed your life? And he said yes, there was a book that changed my life. It was called The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. I see a few people are clapping, you've read the book. Exactly. Now in that book, David Schwartz says you should make a list of all the things you want to achieve before you die. And he recommends a list of a hundred things. I know Mark mentioned that this morning. So Lou Holtz had just lost his job. He was an assistant football coach, lost his job, and he was home. And his wife had to go back to work as a radiologist to make enough money to feed them. And one day she came home and she said, I was in the supermarket and they had this book for sale called The Magic of Thinking Big. Why don't you read it? So he read it. He wrote out 107 goals that he wanted to achieve. 
And when his wife came home at night, he was real excited and he showed it to her. He said, honey, look, 107 things that I want to achieve in my life. Thank you for this book. It's got me real excited. Why don't you read my list? So she read the list. Then she said, at the end of the list, she said, Lou, you need to add one more goal to the list. He said, what's that? She said, find a job. Find a job, Lou. We need to have a job. Now, now he had 108 goals. Lou's now in his 70s. And when I was interviewing him, he said, I have achieved 102 of those 108 goals. And those goals included winning a national football championship, eating dinner at the White House with the sitting president, meeting the Pope, going to the Vatican, appearing on the Johnny Carson late night show. All major goals. Landing a plane on an aircraft carrier was another one he had. Now, what he said was the goals give you direction. They give you a sense of movement in your life. John Goddard is another person we wrote about in the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book. He set 127 goals when he was 15. He's now in his 70s. He's achieved 115 of his 127 goals. So I really want to have all of you do that as a way to get clear about what it is you want in your life. If you've not yet done that exercise, sometime before you get home, on the plane home or whatever, start to think about what would be 101 goals that I want to achieve. When I was interviewing General Wesley Clark, he said it doesn't take any more effort or any more time to dream a big dream than it does to dream a small dream. Barbara today was talking about dreams of changing the world, of bringing your, your influence and your, your, um, your essence, your contribution out into the world. Big dreams. Mark talks about ending hunger and biofuel and today we're doing the um, live earth and we're talking about creating a sustainable planet that's ecologically feasible, that has social justice for all and that has economic sustainability for everybody. Those are huge goals. Let your goals be as big as you want, but don't make them bigger than you want because you don't have to. In other words, trust what you want to do. Walt Disney said, if you can dream it, you can do it. You're not allowed to have a dream that you don't have the capacity to create, either through your own efforts or the efforts of gathering a team together. How many of you have a GPS system in your car? How many of you know what a GPS system is? Yeah, it's simple. You get in my car, I have a Lexus, I get in there and I punch in an address. I can punch in an address in Colorado and it will provide a map for me all the way from where I live in Santa Barbara to Colorado. I don't have to know the way. And the same is true for you. Once you set a goal, the how will show up. Too many of us are concerned. We won't set the big goal because we don't see how we can do it. We don't want to look like an idiot. We don't want to commit to something and be foolish and be disappointed one more time. You do not have to know how. You only have to know what it is you want. And if you're clear about that, then the how will show up. I love this metaphor. I know Harv used it in his seminars and I use it in mine too. It's that if you drive in the dark, and I put this into the seeker, you may remember, if you're driving in the dark, you only see the next hundred yards ahead of you. That's all you need to see. When Mark and I decided we wanted to write a book of stories, we didn't even know how to get an agent. We didn't know how to get a publisher. But later, at about, oh, we're about halfway through the book, we met an agent at a party. And we said, how do you get a book published? He said, I'll be your agent. Then we went to New York, and 24, 33 publishers, whatever it was, turned us down. And then we went, and the pub agent gave us the book back and said, I can't sell it, you have to sell it. So we went to the Booksellers Association convention, because someone said, if you go there, every publisher, there were 4,000 publishers there, they all have booths, most of them have their acquisition editors. So we went and did that. Finally, Health Communications decided to publish it. Now we didn't know how do you market it. So we asked 11 people, including Barbara DeAngelis, John Gray, who'll be speaking here. We asked uh, Stephen Covey, we asked, um, Ken Blanchard, who wrote The One Minute Manager. We asked Harold Bloomfield, who wrote the TM book on Transcendental Meditation. All had best-selling books. And they said, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. We did five things a day that they told us for 14 months. We did not hit a bestseller list for 14 months. But once we hit that list, as Mark said this morning, we were number one on that list in the New York Times list for three years. And then when we brought out the second book, we didn't even think about that. Oh second book, and then a third one, and a fourth one, now 125 books, something like that in print. And then some people came and said, hey, we'd like to license your brand. For what? Dog food. I said, are you kidding me? We're going to retire on dog food. Chicken soup for the pet lover's soul, cat food and dog food. So you never see the whole thing. 
But if you just start, just start. I promise you the how will show up all along the way. People will give you books. They'll say to go to seminars. You'll meet the right people at the right time. The other thing I want to talk about for just a minute, because this is, a, I think, a little bit of a different twist on the law of attraction as I've been talking to people, is we always talk about attracting into our life what we want. Attracting in the million dollars or the perfect spouse or the perfect home. But I want you to think about this as well. Everything that you find yourself attracted to is part of the universal guidance system telling you this is the way you're supposed to be moving. This is where your destiny lies. Barbara talked today about the idea that she gave up the TV thing and that people were offering her TV shows and she said, no, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good. I don't get excited. I don't get turned on. There's no juice for me. And so you look at, you're attracted to certain people. Trust that. You're attracted to certain teachers, to certain seminars, to own certain kinds of things. I remember I was going to a workshop with my wife. It was a conference of a humanistic psychologist. And um, my wife is very, very much into, how to say this, she's, she's much more into people and relationships and pets. I mean, her happiest thing is shoveling horse poop out of our barn, out of our horse's stalls. Not my favorite thing, but she loves it. And doesn't care that much about money. And so I said, I'm going off to this money seminar. The guy was saying, you can triple your income in a year. I said, I want to learn how to do that. And she kind of got mad at me. She was judging me. I thought you were above that. Come on, you know, everything. And so I go and I sit down next to this woman in a seminar. And it's about 10 minutes before it starts. And she says, what do you do? And I told her, I asked her what she did. She's a veterinarian. And I said, really, what do you specialize in? Anything? She said, yeah, cat leukemia. I said, that's interesting. My cat has leukemia. My veterinarian told me it's not curable. She says, no, we've actually come up with a cure. I said, really? And as a result of that meeting, our cat got cured of feline leukemia. See, you never know. You never know. Whatever you're attracted to. See, because the universe, infinite intelligence, God, source, whatever you want to call it, your own unconscious, it can see farther than you. Like right now, you can see from wherever you are up here, but you can't see behind you. But God or source or infinite intelligence is way up here. It sees everything. It sees the traffic jam 20 miles down the road. And all of a sudden you get this intuitive impulse. Gee, I think I'll take the mountain pass today. Well, that's stupid. No, but if you take it, you'll avoid the accident or you'll avoid the, the traffic. You've got to learn to trust your inspirations. As soon as you set a goal, as soon as you have an intention and you believe in it and you get rid of the self-doubt and you have a positive expectancy, you fully expect it to happen, what happens is you're going to start getting little inspirations. You'll be sitting there typing a paper and all of a sudden you'll get this inspiration to walk down the street and maybe take Mrs. Jones, who's a new widow, or some cookies. And you'll think, well, why would I do that? i got a lot of work to get done here. But let's say you do it, and you walk down, you bring her some cookies, and you have some tea, and then she says, oh, and by the way, my son-in-law is here, let me introduce you to him. And you go in and you meet the son-in-law, and you find out he's a Porsche dealer, and he's selling a used Porsche for just the amount of money that you can afford to get that Porsche you always wanted. That kind of stuff will show up over and over and over and over, but you've got to trust the intuition. You have to act. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a spiritual community in Scotland called Findhorn. Any of you heard of Findhorn? The guy who started Fintorn with his wife, Eileen Caddy, his name's Peter Caddy, tells a story of eating, drinking tea with his wife and getting this, he just got this intuitive flash, he should go see his friend Bob. And he didn't act on it for an hour. It was an hour later he got up and he drove into London or wherever it was and he got there and Bob had died 30 minutes earlier. And he said, I learned from that moment, when I get an, ins an inspiration or an intuitive flash, I need to act on it now, right this minute. How many of you have had an intuitive insight to do something, didn't do it, found out someone else did it, and made a whole lot of money doing the thing you thought about but didn't do? Any of you ever had an experience like that? Yeah, you've got to take action. As soon as you have the impulse, start acting on it. Now, three quick techniques to clarify what you want in life, how to ask clearly. One of them we just talked about, but I'm gonna talk about a different one here for a minute. It's called the irritation list. My suggestion is you go back to your home, your house, your apartment, wherever you live, and you make a list of everything that isn't exactly the way you want it. 
anything that irritates you. There's never a stapler by the Xerox machine. The screen door never quite closes and the bugs come in. That picture always hangs at an angle. You put it straight and it hangs at an angle again. Or there's a crack in the wall. Or, you know, the kitchen drawers are a total mess. Or you can't find stuff in the garage or the closet. These things don't fit. Those things don't work. Your kid's room's a mess all the time. There's a smell coming out of it. You know, whatever it might be. Write it down. And then make another half of the sheet of paper and write exactly the way you'd like it to be. Throw away the half of the paper about what you don't want and then go and fix everything so you get exactly what you want. Take a day or two and schedule it. Clean up as many of those little things as you can. And people go, well, why should I do that? I want to be a millionaire. I'm focusing on world peace and you want me to be worried about my sock drawer? And the answer is yes. Because when you don't do, get exactly what you want in the little areas of your life, what you do is you slip into a state called resignation. You start believing you can't have it the way you want it. You actually numb out your awareness to not see that thing anymore. If any of you ever noticed if you have a little crack in the wall and you don't fix it within a month, you stop noticing it? And then a year later, someone says, you got a big crack in your wall. But you stop noticing it. It just became part of the background. Most people are going through life resigned, settling. Most of us are settling. Now, most of you here are not. You've made a choice to go for your life and create it the way you want it and believing you can have what you want. But do this irritation list, clean up all the little things, and the big things commit to at least one a quarter that you're going to get rid of. And then you can set a date for cleaning out the garage, or you can set a date for the new filing system, or getting the car that works, or whatever it is that's important to you. The second thing we already talked about, the 101 goals list. Make sure you do that. Have you seen that book, A Thousand and One Places You Should Visit Before You Die? I mean, right there is a whole bunch of stuff you can put on your list. And we just knocked off Southern France, Nice, Saint-Tropez, topless beaches. What else do we have on the list? But it was a lot of fun. Three years ago, my son said, Dad, you always talk about taking me to Europe. When are you going to do it? And so we went to London, Barcelona, and Paris and spent four days in each city, just me and my 16-year-old son. Had a great time. We had it written down. He knew it was there. And because it was there, it actually ended up happening. The third thing is called the vision exercise. Most of you know about the power of vision, but I'd like to just share this with you real quickly. You focused a lot about finances, millionaire mind, how much money do you want, financial independence, never have to work again. Also look at your business and career goals. Maybe you want to open up China as a market. Maybe you want to be the salesman of the year in your company. Maybe you want to have a whole different career path that you want to go toward. Maybe you'd like to win an award or be elected president of your professional association. What's your vision for your ideal business and career life? Most people have that stuff down. But how many of you have goals for how much fun you're going to have this year? What kind of fun you're going to have this year that's measurable and specific in your vision of your life for the next year or the next two years or the next five years? You need to have your fun time goals. My wife and I, at the beginning of every year, schedule all of our vacations. We take about 10 long weekends, four-day weekends. This year we're taking five week-long week vacations. We just finished one in the south of France. In August we're doing a week in La Jolla with my family. We just came back from Africa in March where we spent a week, and so on and so forth. Schedule the time, because otherwise it never happens. Maybe you want to take salsa dancing lessons. Maybe you'd like to take an improvisational theater class. Maybe you'd like to do stand-up comedy. All kinds of wonderful things you can do, but you've got to schedule them into your life. Health and fitness goals. Do you know what your cholesterol level is? Have you got a goal for that? Do you have a goal for maybe competing in a marathon or a biathlon or a triathlon? Or maybe one year in my health and fitness goals was to get rid of my toenail fungus. Any of you ever have that yellow toenail fungus? And most people just settle for it. Oh, it's old guy's toe disease. Nothing you can do about it. Well, if you take olive leaf extract long enough, you can get rid of it. And that became my goal, one of my goals for the year. So health and fitness goals. Relationships goals. How many of you have written goals for the next year about what you want to accomplish in the area of relationships? Just curious. See a show of hands. Not too many. One year mine was create five new male friends. We just moved to Santa Barbara. And what happens for most men is you move, to, if you have kids, you move to a new town. Your wife goes and takes the kids to school. Your kids form friends. Your wife gets to know the parents of your kids' friends, and that becomes your social network. And I didn't like any of the husbands of my wife's new friends. It just didn't interest me. And none of them were into personal growth. None of them were meditating. None of them had a sense of larger purpose in the world. They just were boring to me. 
And so I made a goal to have five really close friends by the end of the year. So it wasn't just casual, it was a deliberate intention. And as a result of that, a strategy came up when I was meditating a couple weeks later. And every two weeks, I invited someone to have lunch with me. Started with the guy who was a, a football, I mean, a wrestling coach at UCSB. And then turned out, who knew, the police chief of our town is a really cool guy. Someone mentioned that, I had lunch with him, really ended up becoming very close friends, and so on and so forth. So now I have guys I play poker with, people we uh, play bowls, which is a fun game, like, you know, bocce ball kind of thing. I have other people that I meditate with and we do personal growth things together and so forth and so on. But it was a specific goal for the year in terms of relationships. And then the area of personal. Personal would be personal growth, emotional growth, things you want to do that grow you. It could be learning to play the piano. It could be learning French. We heard Art Linkletter speaking, I think, like nine languages. So what are your goals in the personal area? And then finally, have a vision for your life in terms of contribution and legacy. I want to, I want to share a story about this part. There's a man named Kenneth Baring, who used to be a co-owner of the Seattle Seahawks. He was worth about $500 million at the time. I don't know what his net worth is now. It's probably increased. And he said his life went through four stages. The first stage was called stuff. He said, I wasn't happy, and I figured if I had a lot of stuff, I'd be happy. So he got a lot of money, made a lot of money, bought a lot of stuff. He had a private plane, a private yacht. He had the big house. He had the fancy cars. He had everything he wanted, art collections, great wine from around the world. And he said, I still wasn't happy. So I figured I had, maybe I needed better stuff. So he said, the next stage of my life, I just bought a bigger plane, a bigger yacht, a better house, better wine, more expensive this. I still wasn't happy. And he said, well, maybe I was collecting the wrong stuff. And so I created the phase of my life called different stuff. And that's when he said, I bought the Seattle Seahawks. He said, maybe if I own a professional football team, that'd make me happy. So I still wasn't happy. And then he got a call from a friend who said, I'm going to go over to Bosnia and we're going to take a plane full of wheelchairs and all these kids that have either been born malformed or have lost their legs to landmines, we're going to give them wheelchairs because wheelchairs give them mobility and freedom. And so he got in the plane with his friend and they flew over to Bosnia and he got off and they were putting all these kids in wheelchairs. And he said, I picked up this first kid. He was about 11 years old, very, didn't weigh much. He was real thin. And I put him in a wheelchair and I went to turn away to get another wheelchair and the kid wouldn't let go of me. I turned back around, I looked down, and there was tears coming down his face. And he said, please don't go yet. And through an interpreter, he said, I just want to look at your face so I can memorize it. So when we meet again in heaven, I'll be able to thank you one more time. And he said, I started to cry uncontrollably. And he said, it was the first time in my life I felt pure joy. And as a result, Ken came back and he started the Wheelchair Foundation. They've given away over 400,000 wheelchairs to kids around the world. And he said, I've never been happier in my life. And now, and now he's created a new foundation because one of the biggest problems in the world is lack of clean water. We have thousands and thousands of people with all kinds of diseases and cataracts, all because they don't have clean water. And so he started a new foundation. He said, I've never been happier in my life. And he calls this last stage of his life purpose. And he actually wrote a book called A Life of Purpose. The point being, and several people have said this, the real joy comes from giving. Bob Proctor, I know, will talk tomorrow about this. I love this idea. He said, it's critical that you make a lot of money. He said, money is very useful. He said, without money, the good you can do is limited to your physical presence. See, I can show up at a homeless shelter and I can hold kids and I can read stories and I can brush people's hair and I can do lots of stuff, but it's limited to my physical presence. But when you have money, as Mark does and I do and many of the speakers up here do, we give away millions of dollars. We planted over a million trees in Yosemite National Forest, figuring we certainly used up a lot making books. So we thought we ought to put a few back into the ground. It's actually cool to go there and see all these little trees growing up and go, that's our trees. It's really neat. But the point being that you want to have influence for good. You know, Mark talks about creating enlightened millionaires, millionaires that give away at least a million dollars. And if you create a million millionaires that give away a million dollars, you're talking about a trillion dollars in philanthropy in the world. That's not so hard to do. It's really not that big a game to play if you really think about how simple it is. All right. So we've got these seven vision categories. What I'd like to do with you for just a moment is I'd like you to close your eyes 
and trust that your stuff won't blow away in the wind here. And I'm going to mention each of these categories. I'm going to be silent for 30 seconds. And what I'd like you to do is just let come up from you, from the internal natural child, from your inner self, your high self, the part of you that knows what you really want, to come up with what do I really want in that arena of my life. And I would say think in terms of the next two years. So two years from now, what would you like to say you've accomplished financially or career-wise or so forth? So just a little bit of going inside so you're not listening to me and just being a speech will kind of just take it inside a little deeply. So take a deep breath, close your eyes. And take another deep breath and just let it all go. You can feel the wind on your face, a little bit of moisture. Remember, whatever it rains, it's cleansing, it's cleaning, cleaning out the old, bringing in the new. In Hawaii, they say, whenever it rains, it's auspicious. It's the God's way of blessing the event. So we're going to get a real blessing now. So think of the area of financial. What do you truly want in your deepest heart, financially for yourself, two years from now? What would you like to have accomplished? What's your vision for that? And then think about the area of business and career. What do you want to accomplish? What's your vision for what you will have been able to achieve two years from now? And then focus on the area of fun and recreation. Two years from now, what do you want to say you've done or experienced in terms of really having fun or recreation, travel, anything in that arena? And then think about the area of health and fitness. What do you want to have accomplished in that area of your life? Maybe it's weight loss. Maybe it's more vitality, more flexibility. Maybe a better diet that you're now eating. Then think about the area of relationships. What do you want to have accomplished in the area of relationships? And then think about the area of personal. What do you want to have accomplished just because you want to do it in terms of personal growth or development, spiritual development, education? And then finally, the area of contribution. Where do you want to volunteer? Where do you want your money to go? What do you want to be different in the world because of your efforts? Very good. Then go ahead when you're ready. Open your eyes. Come on back. And when you have a moment, perhaps not now because it's a little challenging, but make sure you write that down. Get it down on paper. Share it with your partner. Put it up on the refrigerator. Look at it every day. What I do is I have three goals in every one of those arenas. So I have 21 goals every year. And then I make a eight and a half by 11 sheet with a picture. I either get it from you know Google Images or I pull them out of magazines. I put them under a page protector and I write a little affirmation over it with a specific measurable goal. Then each day I go through that and I look at it and I visualize it and I feel the feelings I would feel if I already had it. And every year I achieve at least 18 of those 21 goals and within two years the ones I didn't get, the three that I didn't get, I have achieved. I could go back over my life. Everything I've ever wanted has come true. Everything. Now, I'm still working on bigger goals like transforming education, world peace, ending hunger, but those are all moving along quite nicely in terms of the measurements that we're doing in the world of those things. Now, the next step, obviously, and we won't do that here either, but you've got to set measurable goals. How much by when? Want to be wealthier? How much? Be specific. So I'd like to double my income because I will earn $350,000 by midnight, December 31st, 2008 at 5 p.m. Specific. I'd like to become a millionaire. I will have a net worth of one million by midnight, December 31st, 2009 at 5 p.m. Like to lose weight and get fit. Might be I will weigh 190 pounds and complete a 10K run by December 30th, 2007. I want to look at the law of attraction with you just a little bit. We know the law of attraction works like gravity, which is always. I just got asked the other day, we were filming a PBS special. It's going to be a pledge drive special. I was in Boston doing that yesterday. And one of the questions that got asked from the audience was, well, what about Darfur, and what about Katrina, and what about 
I'm now coming to believe, and I didn't believe this three years ago, but as more I study law of attraction and hang out with the other people teaching it, I'm now beginning to believe that everything is attracted into our life, either by our behavior, by our thoughts, by our fears, by our fantasies, the things we talk about, the things we watch on TV, and we go, oh, I hope that never happens to me, or we watch a movie like Blood Diamond and we see all this violence over diamonds and we get really upset about it, we actually create more of everything we have intense feelings about. So literally, I want you to act as if you're creating everything and become really, 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 really disciplined about what you think, what you read, what you watch, what you talk about. I was with Mark Victor Hansen in New York about all oh, three months ago. We were getting some awards for books, some convention, and oh, we, we went out to dinner afterwards about 10 o'clock, and we talked till about 2 in the morning. And literally, in that four hours, neither one of us said one negative thing about anything or anybody. Mark told me the projects he was working on, and I went, that's fabulous. How can I help you? You need to meet this person. I just met that person. You guys need the network. It was all about how do we do it? Where do we do it? What's happening? What's good? What's good news? Mark was saying, wow, we can educate a kid in Africa for $120 a year. We can send him to college in Africa. I didn't know it was that cheap. You could do that. We talked about microloans. We talked about educating. We talked about some research that shows the fastest way to end hunger in the world is to educate young girls in rural villages. Who knew the research? But it's there. So literally, we just, yes, yes, yes. How do we do it? Then I get on the plane the next morning to fly back to LA, and the guy next to me is talking about how crappy the world is, how bad his children are, the government, this thing is bad. Never occurred to us once to have a negative thought. It was all about what do we want? Let's make it happen. How can we help each other? You go. And so basically, that's what you want to be doing, only focusing and talking about exactly what you want. When you talk about something's not working, all you're going to do is create more of it's not working. People come up to me and say, I've been doing the law of attraction for three months. I still don't have my car. It's, it doesn't work. Well, what you're focusing on is it doesn't work. And you're going to get more of it doesn't work. What you want to focus on is where it is working. Hey, I wanted to get a place by the window at the restaurant, and I got it. You know, some people keep what they call a manifestation journal. At the end of every day, what, man what did I manifest? Well, how's it working? And what we know is what we focus on what? It expands. And so you want to focus on only that which what you, is what you want. Okay. Whatever you think about, talk about, and fantasize about, or give your attention to, you're going to attract more of. So you really have to become deliberate and intentional. Now, three stages we talked about. Ask, believe, and receive. So I want to move into the next section here. In a moment, we're going to talk about ask, believing, and we're talking about creating a vibrational match for that which you want into your life. You must always be feeling good. Anytime you're feeling good, you attract more into your life to feel good about. When you're feeling bad, when you're upset, when you're pissed off, when you're resentful, when you're scared, when you're in doubt, you're actually pushing away all the things that are waiting to come into your life. Most of what you want is kind of sitting out there in the parking lot waiting to come in, but when you're talking about negativity and you're criticizing other people, it's pushing it away. And the faster you can get over that, the faster you'll manage stuff, stuff into your life. So the more we can be in gratitude and abundance. Let's talk about gratitude for a minute. When you watch the movie The Secret, you saw about the gratitude rock that Lee Brower uses in his life. John D. Martini never gets out of bed until he has a tear of gratitude. Sometimes he says, I'm in there for an hour, just focusing on what I'm grateful for. But until that tear comes out of my eye, I do not get out of bed. And John is a millionaire, probably a hundred times over. Started out as a dyslexic kid. He was basically dying when this person took him under his wing and gave him an affirmation, which was something like to the effect of, I am a wise person and everyone I touch is benefited by my wisdom. And now, John has read every book ever written by any Nobel laureate in any field in the last 10 years. And he's a genius at what he does. Whereas before they said, you've got to drop out of school, you're ADD. And at 14, he dropped out of school. Gratitude. Rhonda Byrne, when she wrote the book, The Secret, she said, I didn't start to write until I was, had so much gratitude in my heart that I would have a tear come down my face. She said, as soon as I was in that space, I could, my fingers were just flying. In a book, she wrote that book in like three weeks. Three weeks, wrote a book that sold over 3.75 million copies because she was in the space to receive. 
because when you're in a space of gratitude, you're saying, I accept that which has been given to me, I appreciate it, and what that does, it opens up a space for more to flow in. The word grace, we say we're under grace, you know, the grace of God. The word gracias in Spanish, gratitude, it's all from the same root word. The more gratitude we have, the more grace we receive that flows through us out into the universe in terms of our creativity and drawing to us that which we want. Abundance and generosity. You want to be always giving as much as you can. Barbara talked about that hugely today. Be in a state of joy. I now teach that at least one hour a day you need to take for yourself and do the things that you most love to do. Right now I'm learning to play the piano, so that's what my hour is about. For my wife it's the horse poop and petting our dog and our cats and all of that stuff. She loves it. I don't, she just does. Um, for someone else, it's listening to Bach or Beethoven or listening to Bono or whatever it might be. For someone else, it's painting or gardening. I was doing a seminar up in Canada, and actually, I was actually on a TV show up in Canada, and this woman stood up in the audience and she said, I have a question. I said, great, what is it? She said, I haven't been happy for seven years. You're talking about joy. I haven't, been, I haven't experienced joy for seven years. I said, what happened seven years ago? She said, my husband died. I said, really? I said, what did you used to do that brought you joy before your husband died? She said, well, I used to paint, I used to garden, I used to play the piano. And I said, have you done any of that in the last seven years? She says, no. I said, well, here, go, do, go home, and tonight I want you to play the piano. Tomorrow I want you to go out and garden, and the next day I want you to buy some paints and paint something. Then I want you to write me a letter or give me a phone call, and I gave her my card. And about a week later I got a call, and she said, I can't tell you how happy I am. Happiness partly comes from doing things that make you happy. And for some reason, most of us spend our time doing the things we think we should do, and we don't go out and do the things that make us happy. So literally, make a discipline of doing the things that bring you joy. It's like having a joy diet. And basically, if you can get into joy all the time, like Mother Teresa was, or the Dalai Lama is, or Mark Victor Hansen is 90% of the time, and I am 90% of the time, then things just start flowing into your life at a magical rate. Okay, forgiveness is another big piece. You must forgive, because anytime you're holding resentment, you're not in joy, you're not in love, you're not in inner peace. You have to let go and release. And there are all kinds of powerful processes. John Gray wrote a book about the total truth process. If you can feel it, you can heal it. There's a book on um, letting go of, uh, of, of uh, on forgiveness by Jerry Jampolsky. I mean, there's many, many techniques out there. Find one and use it. The emotional freedom technique, the five-minute phobia cure. There's a ton of technology that can, in like five minutes, you can get rid of a phobia. In five minutes, you can get rid of a negative belief, just tapping on certain meridian points. Things that we teach in our seminars, you can go into in greater depth. Be in a state of love. Always expect the positive. Always expect the positive. I basically gave Mark a little feedback. I mean, I think everything he said this morning, but once he, he said, oh, I don't think Al Gore will ever get 2.5 million people to watch that TV show. I said, Mark, that's a negative thought. Expect the positive. If you don't expect it, it won't happen. So you want to always be in that state of expecting that it's going to show up. Expecting it. I mean, how many of you would call Domino's Pizza, order your pizza, and then call them back and go, are you guys really going to bring it over? You sure? You're not kidding me. Yeah, you really do that. Okay. You know, if you did that three or four times, they'd, they'd put your number on caller ID and they wouldn't take your call anymore. And yet we do that with the universe all the time. I'd like a Porsche. Oh, but I can't afford it. I'd like a Porsche, but you know, whatever. Now, probably more today we should say, I'd like a Prius instead of a Porsche, right? We're all learning. Some of the things we've been trained to want aren't really the best things for us. And we have to learn some new, new stuff around that. All right, I'm going to skip over that slide. Here, I love this quote from Tiger Woods. He says, one of the things my dad kept instilling me was the joy of the game. He made it fun for me. A lot of times I see a lot of kids, they don't enjoy being out there. It's a shame. You're supposed to enjoy the game. I say the same thing about life. You're supposed to enjoy the game. One of the things I try to instill in my clinics is, yes, go out there and give it all you have, but more importantly, enjoy what you're doing. If you're not loving it, you know, all the teachers say, do what you love, the money will follow. Follow your passion, follow your heart. I don't know if Alan Cohen said this when he talked to you, but it was one of the things I learned in his book. 
Did he, did he mention this concept of hell yes or hell no? Yes. Yeah, that's a great idea. If it's not a hell yes instantly, it's called screw it. If you've got to be going like, well, maybe, maybe not. Let me do it. I'll make a list. These are the pros. These are the cons. If you didn't get an instant, yeah. I mean, when Lynn Twist, who started the Hunger Project, and I met her about a year ago, said, we bring people over to our chateau every summer, 16 people for a week. I just went. And she said, would you like to come? This year is our guest. And I was like, yeah. I want to come. It was like, well, let me talk to my wife, see if we can schedule it. As soon as you're doing that, it's like, it's not good. So you got to be following the excitement, following the juice. Mother Teresa once, she said, once I asked my counselor for advice about my vocation. I asked, how can I know if God is calling me and for what is he calling me? And he answered, you'll know by your happiness. If you're happy, this will be the proof of your vocation. I think it was uh, Thomas Edison said, when your vocation becomes your vacation, then the rest of your life is a blessing. So you want to be doing the thing that you would do, that you get paid for doing the thing you love to do. In my seminars, I'll have people make a list, 20 things you love to do. When I first did that exercise, I wrote, I love to hang out with really cool people. I love to hang out with intellectuals who are thinking cutting edge thoughts. I love to open my mail. I love to listen to music. Anyway, I went down my list. Then, then the, the seminar leader said, Think of five ways you could make money doing that. I thought, how can I make money hanging out with really cool people? Well, one of the things I just did two years ago, I created something called the Transformational Leadership Council. We have a hundred members of people like John Gray, who will be speaking to you tomorrow, and Gay Hendricks, who wrote all the books on relationships. And we get together twice a year for four days. And as a result of that, we have now co-ventured all kinds of cool things that have basically doubled my income in the last two years. And I'm hanging out with cool people. I'm making money doing the things I thought used to be what you got to do when you weren't working. So you want to keep following that passion. Now, Law of Attraction says believe. You've got to believe it's possible. Trust your internal guidance system. We've talked about that. I want to share with you a story about a guy named Cliff Young. Cliff Young was 61 years old when he showed up at the beginning of a long-distance race in Australia. The race was 875 kilometers. That's about 650 miles. He was wearing overalls. He was wearing construction boots. All the other guys were 25 or 30. They're all in their Adidas, Nike, Puma, Asics running gear. He looks like an old farmer. He actually had galoshes on over his boots, he says, in case of rain. They said, have you ever run a long distance race before? He said, no. He said, well, why do you think you can do this? Have you ever run a marathon? I mean, this is like six and a half days. He said, no, but I'm a farmer and I have to chase my sheep around and sometimes I have trouble and I have to chase them for two or three days and I don't seem to get tired. I think I can do it. He said, why don't you start with a shorter race? He said, well, this was the only days that were free on my schedule when it was a race schedule. I said, okay. So all the racers, the, the gun goes off and they all take off and they're really running fast and Cliff's running like this. They called it the Cliff Young Shuffle. Now Cliff had an advantage nobody knew about. Cliff had never talked to a coach. He'd never talked to an elite distance runner. He'd never read Runner's World magazine. He'd never read a book on long distance running. He didn't know that when you do a long distance race, you run for 18 hours, sleep for six. Run for 18, sleep for six. Run for 18, sleep for six. So he was running so slow, when he got up to the part where everyone was gone to bed, they were all asleep. No one told him to stop and go to bed. So he just kept running on by. He ran nonstop for five and one half days and broke the record by 12 hours. See, sometimes what you think you know gets in the way of what's possible. If you believe you can do something, you can figure it out. But you have to believe. You have to believe it's coming into your life. I love this quote. It says, never tell anyone something cannot be done. God may have been waiting for centuries for somebody ignorant enough of the impossible to do that very thing. You know, you think of all the technologies we have, the airplane, FedEx. When the guy that put FedEx together, he was an MBA student at Yale, and he presented the paper that outlined the FedEx process, they gave him an F on it and said it's not possible, it will never happen. And now when you think it absolutely positively has to be there overnight, you go what? FedEx. So 
everything that exists started out as somebody's dream, somebody's idea, and nine times out of ten, they told you it couldn't happen. Here's a kid named Farah Gray, 19 years old, born in the ghetto, mother's on welfare. At the age of six, he starts his first company. By the age of 11, he has three companies. Now, they're small. They do things like take rocks, paint them, go door to door and sell them as paperweights. But he made $50 his first day doing that, which was more than his mother made when she was the housekeeper. And then he got a bunch of kids together and they would go to older people and they'd say, we'll go buy your groceries for you and bring them back in our wagons. You just give us a couple of bucks. He gave one to the guy who went to get the groceries, kept one for himself, had a thing going. By the age of 12, he created something called the Urban Neighborhood Education Economic Council, called Unique. He was getting businessmen like many of you and Harv and people like that to come in and speak to the other kids who were 12 and 13 to teach them business practices. By the age of 14, he had read a book by Deepak Chopra called The Seven, laws of, the Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. One of them was the law of least effort. In other words, the thing that is the least effort for you, the thing that's easiest to do, that you can't imagine people would pay you for, is the thing that you need to go for, the thing you love to do. He said, what do I love? I love food, and I love kids. So what I'm going to do is start a food company for kids. He said, what do kids like? Kids like sweet things. So he created a syrup, like a maple syrup type thing that his grandmother used to have a recipe for. And in one and a half years, he built that company up to, now he's all of 16, and he sells it for one and a half million dollars. He drops out of high school, moves to Las Vegas, starts a newspaper, opens a real estate agency, then a real estate development company, then he writes a book called The Rillionaire at the age of 19, and he's worth tens of millions of dollars. Why? because he believed he could do anything he wanted to do. He said, if someone else can do it, I can do it. If Harv can do it, you can do it. If Mark can do it, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. There's no, if Eric Weyenmayer, a blind guy, can climb Mount Everest, there's nothing we can't do. But you have to believe it. So every project you create, you believe you're going to create, you're going to get, you're going to get the result you want. Oprah Winfrey said, you do not become what you want, you become what you believe. When I was on the Oprah Winfrey show, sitting next to her, the auric field that came out of her, the level of charisma, would almost knock you over. And she said, I believed this stuff long before it was called the secret, and so on and so forth. But she believed as a little child, I can do anything I want. And she went out and did it. So can you. Step number four says, release the brakes. It's another way of saying create a vibrational match. And I'll just talk about this for a few minutes, and I think my time's going to run out here. Now... How do we do that? In order to receive something into our life, we have to be feeling the feelings we would feel if we already had the thing that we want to come into our life. So I have to feel like a millionaire before the million can come in. I have to feel abundant. I have to feel full of love before I attract the love I want. Gandhi said, be the thing you want. So if you want love, be loving. You want joy, be joyful. You'll attract more of that into your life. So I'm going to teach you four quick techniques. Most of you know these, but ask yourself, am I doing them? Number one, affirmations. So I have an affirmation since I'm reveling in my $6 million a year personal income. Actually, this year it's up to nine on my affirmation card. So you want to have an affirmation describing the result is already achieved. I'm reveling in my income. And I close my eyes every morning. And I feel the feeling. I see the bank account. I see my IRS report. $9 million gross personal income. And then I move to my next thing. This is one I used a number of years ago. I'm enjoying looking at my physically fit 185 pound body in the mirror. Now if you look at that closely, you'll see my face when I have brown hair cut out and put over a body that was in some muscle magazine. And I put that on my, my mirror every morning. And every time I'd look at that, I'd say, gee, I don't quite look like that. And then I'd go into the gym, I'd lift weights, and I'd eat better and so forth. Now, I'll never look like that. I'm not going to spend six hours in the gym. But it basically motivated me. And it said I'm already experiencing it right now, even though I wasn't. By the way, a great technique, and I put that off on person. Don't freak out in the AV department up there. But I just didn't want you looking at that slide. When you're trying to lose weight, take your scale, and whatever weight you want to weigh, write it on a piece of paper, put it over your scale. So every time you step on your scale, you go, oh, far out, 185, this is cool. <laughs> because see, what happens, you step on there and go, shit, 
220 pounds, that sucks. And what are you gonna attract when you have that? You're gonna attract 220 pounds, that sucks. See, so you're basically fooling yourself, you're programming your unconscious to create the 185 or the 115 or whatever you want. When Mark and I were writing Chicken Soup for the Soul, people would say, what are you doing? We're writing a best-selling book. We never said we're writing a book, we're writing a best-selling book. And then it changed to we're happily celebrating the sale of 1.5 million copies of Chicken Soup for the Soul. What I have right now is I'm sharing my open, loving heart and deep spiritual wisdom with everyone I meet. You want affirmations for every aspect of your vision, and this is one of mine. So, you state your desired outcome as if it's already happening, feel the feeling, and then you got it. I'm happily driving my new BMW down the highway. I love this idea. You go to the dealership, you take your camera, you sit in the car, you look out the window, and you say, take my picture. I'll be back to buy this in a month or two. Then you take that picture home, blow it up, 8x10, 14x10, put it on your refrigerator, make it your screensaver, and then it just keeps coming into your consciousness. That's my car, that's my car, that's my car. I did that, I wanted an Audi one year, and about three months after I started, a friend of mine came who actually owned an Audi, and he said, I'm going to Europe for six months, I don't want my car to sit because it needs to run, would you be willing to use my car for the next six months? Sure, why not? It's a great car. I didn't have to pay for it. Go down to the dealership, sit in the car, put your hands on the wheel, feel the feelings, get used to it. If you want to stay in world-class hotels like the Four Seasons, go to the Four Seasons. If you can't afford a room there, just sit in the lobby and have a drink. Go to the bar, have one drink. Sit in the lobby, watch the rich people come by and say, someday that's me, or now that's me, because it is you. You're sitting in the lobby of the Ritz-Carlton, whatever it might be. Get used to the feeling. Go to the houses. When they have open houses for houses that cost $10 million, go. My wife used to say, why go? We can't afford it. I say, yes, we will be able to. And now I live in a $6.5 million estate. So the point is, you want to get used to the feeling. You don't want to feel uncomfortable. Have you ever been to Rodeo Drive and gone into some of the stores where men's shirts start at like $450, the suits are like $2,000 and up, and you walk in and you go, I don't belong in here. It's almost like they're going to ask you for your Platinum American Express card and you won't have one and they're going to throw you out like you're a homeless person. The truth is, go in there, try on the shirts, try on the suits. Before we could afford it, we went into Armani, my wife tried on these suits, she looked incredible. I went, honey, that's you. And she said, I know. And now we can afford them. We couldn't afford them back then, but now we can. So get into the feeling of it. All right, create vision board. How many of you have a vision board or a wish book? Okay. Here's one, a friend of mine, Rick Kinman. has got all this stuff on it. Here's this, I love this one. Someone just sent me this. This was a woman who was single. She wanted to be married and she wanted to get married in Greece. And you see the pictures she had on her vision board. And then she sends me this. Six months after she made the vision board, she met a guy, he proposed, they got married and they did it in Greece. Came out of the blue. Mark wrote a book called Out of the Blue. It will come out of the blue. Here's some of the things on my vision board. And there's a picture of Oprah and I was on her show, millions of dollars. I'm working on that body on the left hand side. <laughs> and more flexibility, getting more sleep. I want to go to the Taj Mahal in India and do some more meditation. Picture of my wife and I enjoy my mortgage paid in full and so forth and so on. And then I, I ran across this really cool thing on YouTube. You might want to write this down. There's a guy named Malcolm Cohen, C-O-H-A-N. And he has a thing called Think It's So. You just go to YouTube and type in Think It's So. And what he's done now, he's created a proprietary software package where you can take your, your pictures from Google and all these places and you put them into this package and then what it does, it becomes a screensaver that pops up on your screen and works like a PowerPoint presentation that just keeps rotating by. So Think It's So, Malcolm Cohen, C-O-H-A-N. He's an Australian. And once I learned that, what I did, these are just some of the pictures that are in my uh, screensaver now. This one says, I'm feeling exhilarated talking to audiences of 5,000 people or more. I've talked to audiences of 5,000 people or more 10 times in the last three months, including 17,500 screaming women at Arbonne. Amazing. A lot of fun. I'm enjoying celebrating total sales of 5 million copies of the Success Principles book and DVD. We are celebrating having sold more than one billion copies of Chicken Soup for the Soul books and we had a person mock up Time Magazine cover for us. I'm thrilled to be working with people in positions of power to create a better world.
Turns out the woman who was the correspondence secretary for George Bush had submitted five chicken soup stories. We didn't know. And she comes and says, I'm about to quit and go do another thing. You want to have dinner at the White or lunch at the White House? So we went, and one of the things we got to do was go into the press room where Tony Snow stands up there and goes, yes, question, question. I got to take that picture. I'm sitting up with Mark at 2 o'clock this afternoon, and he says he was with Gene Houston in Greece. Gene Houston is one of the major advisors to Hillary Clinton, and Gene Houston said, we want you and Jack to work with the Democratic Party to help advise them for this new administration to bring more of this consciousness. So that, that was my, in my dream board, you know, my vision board, my, my, my screensaver. I put that in three months ago and now we're, all, we're getting an invitation to play. I'm enjoying playing golf on 12 world-class golf courses around the world. We just played in southern France on one of them, joyously receiving 26 relaxing massages in 2007, and so on. Third thing, visualization every single day. Now let me tell you a principle here that's critical. It's called the 30-day the, the, the principle. Research was done at NASA. They had astronauts wear concave lens goggles for 30 days. Concave lens goggles make your world appear upside down. Imagine 24 hours a day for 30 days, everything's upside down. You're trying to negotiate the stairs, your soup, which looks up there. You've got to reach down here to eat it. They did this to see if they would become nauseous, if they would lose their ability to focus, if they would become hostile. How would they relate to being in outer space when there was no gravity? That was basically the experiment. What they found that they didn't expect to find was that 25 to 30 days into it, every one of the astronauts their brain flipped the image right side up again. Even though the image was coming in upside down, their brain flipped it right side up. What the neuroscientists tell us is it takes 25 to 30 days to create a new neural pathway in your brain. It takes 25 to 30 days to lock in a new belief system. It takes 25 to 30 days to lock in a new habit pattern. It takes 25 to 30 days to have your visualization and affirmation start to change the whole way your brain perceives the world. See, your perception is part of what's controlling your reality. Right now, you're not aware of what you're feeling in your right foot, but as soon as I say right foot, you're aware of it. But as soon as I say left hand, that's where your awareness goes. So the reality is you're, all these things were streaming into your brain, but your reticular system was filtering out everything, probably, but what I was saying. But as soon as I say right foot, it changes. So as soon as you start visualizing and you do that for 30 days, the reticular system in your brain says start letting in everything that will help us become a millionaire or solve world hunger or work with the president or whatever it might be. So you want to be visualizing for 30 days in a row without fail, whatever it is you want. Because they did an experiment where on day 15, they had the, half the astronauts take their glasses off, put them on back on day 16, took another 25 to 30 days before the phenomenon occurred again. So you must do 25 to 30 days. Does that make sense? That's one reason most people's affirmations don't work. It's one reason a lot of the seminars they take don't work, because they don't take the tools and do them every day for 30 days. It's like that 10-24-7 idea. The repetition over and over locks it into the unconscious and also opens up the perceptual uh, field for you and also programs universal consciousness out there in the world. Okay, this is one of the most powerful tools that Mark and I have discovered. It's called Act As If. You all know you start acting like a millionaire before you're a millionaire. Here's a cool technique. It's called the come as you'll be party. Have any of you done a come as you'll be party? Okay, here's what you do. Mark and I went to a party. We, we belonged to an organization we helped create called the Inside Edge. It had a hundred cutting edge people like Barbara Diaz was a member, Tony Robbins was a member and so forth. And they had a party on the Queen Mary. And what we did was we got there and they had paparazzi taking all our pictures and big red carpet, and we had to act as if it were five years in the future and we had achieved every one of our goals. And for three hours, everyone had to pretend it was five years later. People were walking around with books they'd written, people were walking around, their cell phone would ring, and they'd say things like, um, oh, that's good, yeah, buy 5,000 shares. Yeah, no, no, sell those. Yeah, 10,000 of those. Oh, good, call you back later. They were trading all these great stocks. I was doing this party with one of my seminars recently, and this kid, 26, was walking around with his cell phone going, Jennifer, I told you don't call me here. No. 
And then the phone would ring in. Jennifer, leave me alone. No, I know, I know I was the best lover you ever had. I know, honey. I know I was the most sensitive person. Oh, I know you love me. I'm sorry, I just have to move on. Finally, by the end of the evening, he takes one more call. He goes, J-Lo, leave me alone. I'm sick of it. You know? And people were showing us pictures of the boats they owned and the Argentinian um, uh, ranches they'd bought and, and the camps they'd set up for homeless children and on and on and on. Now, if you do that for two or three hours and just stay in that space, that's the most powerful act as if we've ever figured out how to make happen. Go home. If you buy my book, I think it's chapter 11, it's called Act As If. There's a whole section on how to create a come as you'll be party. There's an invitation in there you can mock up and send out to people. But really do that. It's one of the most powerful things you can ever do. Now, let me move this toward closure here. I just want to talk about one last thing. Let me find it for you real quick here. One of the principles that we work with is if you want to learn, you've got to stay motivated with the masters. You know, Harv talked about the masters. And so principle number eight in my system is stay motivated with the masters. And there's a lot of ways to do that. You come to sessions like this. You take the peak performance, you know, ultimate seminar package, whatever. You keep being exposed to masterful ideas and masterful people. Shared that cartoon with you. Here's a guy named Jeff Arch. How many of you know who Jeff Arch is? See, most of you have never heard of Jeff Arch, but you will know him in a second. Jeff Arch, one day, was sitting there, and he was miserable. His life sucked. And he said, you know, I'm watching these infomercials on TV, and I'm seeing all these people talk about the money they make, and, and I've always thought that was BS. Didn't work. But, you know, their lives seem to be working pretty well. They got money. They're on TV. I'm not. And he wanted to be a playwright. He'd written two plays. They failed miserably. His wife said, get a real job. We have a kid coming. And he was running a karate studio, and he was miserable. And so what he did was he said, I'm going to buy an audio program. The audio program sold for $149. He ordered it, and he listened to it, and it changed his life. He said, wow, I got to go for my dream. I have to shoot one more time for my passion. So he quit his job as a karate studio. And he said, I'm going to write one more screenplay or one more play. He wrote a screenplay. And it was about a movie, kind of James Bond, you know, Russians versus Americans. He took it to, uh, to California. And the day he went there, the Berlin Wall fell. And everyone said, we just don't want a Cold War movie anymore for a while because the Berlin Wall just fell down. Context isn't right. He said, before I listened to that audio program, I would have said, the world sucks. See, this is just one more example. I get screwed. He said, but the truth is, I realized I had just made a decision where I picked a topic that wasn't timeless. And then I said, okay, what's a timeless topic that nothing, that changes in the world can change it? And he said, love, love, love. Everyone loves love. Doesn't matter what happens in the world about love. Then he said, what's the typical love story? Boy meets girl, there's some problem. You know, Romeo and Juliet, two different warring families, can't get together. West Side Story, two different gangs, can't get together. Look who's coming to dinner, black guy, white woman. And we can go down the list. There's always this thing, you got to get through it. Finally, they, they get together, end of story, everyone's happy. He said, what if I do something totally different? What if they don't meet until the last scene of the movie? That's never been done. So he wrote a little, he wrote a little screenplay called Sleepless in Seattle. And that screenplay earned him $500,000. And now every screenplay he writes is worth a million dollars. Because he's now a, a class A, you know, top tier screenwriter in LA. And what happened was one audio program that changed his life forever. $149 investment turned into $500,000. So success principle number nine is you got to learn more to earn more. Rhonda Byrne, who did The Secret, her life was miserable. Her daughter came to her and gave her a book. It was called The Science of Getting Rich by Wallace Waddles. How many of you have read that book? You'll hear Bob Proctor talk about that tremendously tomorrow. It's the book that changed his life. It's the book that later I read after Think and Grow Rich and other books that changed my life. She reads this book. She gets so excited about it. She says, why doesn't everyone know this? She goes out and she spends, I think she bought 300 books over the course of about four months. She read 300 books on law of attraction, science of success. Her investment was probably close to $1,000. Maybe more, a couple thousand, three thousand dollars. Now she goes and she makes a movie called The Secret, and what happens is that movie costs three million dollars to make. They've sold over three million copies. They've made ninety million dollars based on her willingness to become a student to learn more. And as a result of that, a producer who was, you know, okay in, in Australia, now has a home about a block from Oprah, is working on a second movie, is working with Harpo Productions to create a reality show on The Secret. 
because she was willing to invest in her growth. Here's somebody who read my book. Look at all the little tabs in there. They've studied it more than I did. It's amazing. We've talked about a couple of principles of success. It's just the tip of the iceberg. So final story. Woman calls her minister. Says, Reverend Jim, I just came back from the hospital and they've diagnosed me with terminal cancer. I wonder if you could come over this afternoon. He says, sure, of course, Aunt Hattie, I'll come over. Goes over to her house, he tries to comfort her. She says, don't comfort me, I'm, I'm fine, I don't, I, I, I don't I understand healing. I just want to plan my funeral. Would you help me plan my funeral? And she says, he says, of course, I'll help you plan your funeral. She says, I want to be buried in this dress. I want this hymn sung. I want these kind of flowers. I want a memory card that you give to all the people that came. I want my picture on it. This is my favorite poem. I'd like that on it. And she went on all the things she wanted. And then she said, I want to be buried with my family Bible in my left hand and a fork in my right hand. And he says, well, I understand the Bible, Aunt Hattie. You're a very religious person. But why the fork? He says, you know, whenever we have... He says, you know, whenever we have a church social and they're coming by to collect the plates after we've had a dinner down in the basement of the church, whenever there's going to be a really great dessert, something like apple pie or cherry pie or peach cobbler or chocolate cake, they always say, keep your fork. And whenever they say, keep your fork, I know we're going to have a really great dessert. So they're going to come by my casket and they're going to look in. And they're going to go... Reverend Jim, I understand the Bible. Aunt Hattie was very religious, but why the fork? Just look him in the eye and say, Aunt Hattie knew the best was still yet to come. And so for all of you, if you take these principles that you're learning here from all the different teachers, not just mine, but all of them, this whole three days becomes like a total gestalt. Everything I would have said that I didn't, someone else is going to say. You're going to get the full package. But if you'll go back and put them into practice, and if you take the things I have, and if they're attracted to you, or you're attracted to them, put them into practice. Do the work. Because there is some time to put in. And if it feels good and it's fun, continue to do it. If it's not, don't. If you put the work in, you keep your consciousness clear, and you think the thoughts, you create a vibrational match, I promise you, for each and every one of you, the best is still yet to come. Thank you. Have a great life. It's been a pleasure and honor to speak to you. Thank you very much.